There are so many damn games on the Switch eShop these days, it can make your head spin. And being the irresponsible adult that I am, I often find myself impulse buying tons of titles if I see them on a big enough sale. I have amassed such a huge collection of bullcrap on my Switch that I've been planning on doing a series of brief reviews for a while. Well, it has been a while, and we're here right now, so let's talk some digital downloads. First up is Celeste. Kicking things off with a better known game, most of you into the indie game scene have probably already heard of Celeste, and for good reason, it's a damn solid title. Matt Thorson, the main man behind Celeste, is someone I have been following for years. I've been playing his game since middle school, and while most of his early work can no longer be found on his website, I fortunately still had many of his games backed up on some of my old school thumb drives that held a whopping 500 megabytes. That was a lot back then, trust me. I've been planning to eventually do a complete works of all his games, but the reason I bring this up now and the reason I was such a fan of him to begin with is that I can tell by the way he designs games that he holds very similar values and beliefs in game design as I do. His work always emphasizes difficulty, constant progression, and most importantly, control. Years and dozens of games later, Celeste still emphasizes all of these things. The controls are extremely responsive with understandable weight, and while Celeste gets challenged it never feels unfair. If that sounds good to you, then Celeste is an easy buy because you're already looking at the rest. The sound design is fantastic, the creativity showcased in each new area is ingenious, and while the pixel resolution is a bit small, it blends well with all the shaders to make for some striking landscapes. Lengthwise, Celeste is a bit on the short side. My first run through the main story took me 4 or so hours. That being said, Celeste is riddled with collectibles and bonus levels, so if you're a completionist, that might take you upwards of 40 hours if this site is to be believed. Heavy emphasis on the to be believed thing, because this website also says that a vanilla run through the story is 8 hours. And even after beating the game and briefly looking at one of the extra levels, my Switch only has me clocked in at 5 hours. The game retails at 20 and unless you plan to 100% this, that might not be the price you want to pay. Celeste is a great game but I'd wait for it to go on sale for about 12 bucks if you only plan to do a basic playthrough. Venture Kid. So this is a Mega Man clone, and as far as those go, eh, it's not bad. I mean, it's not great either, but if you like the classic 8-bit Mega Mans, you'll likely get a kick out of Venture Kid. By the way, when I say 8-bit Mega Mans, I mostly mean 1 and 2. Generic Andy here can't slide, and he certainly can't charge his... hand? I don't know, he's clearly holding a gun in the promotional art, so beats me what the hell this is. Bosses that give you new weapons, one-hit kill spikes, start to finish this is a fairly standardized Mega Man experience. Venture Kid's biggest falter is that it's exceptionally generic. The bosses are default things like Pharaoh, Monkey, Construction Worker, you travel through your token cave, ancient tomb, jungle, even the protagonist, who is actually called Andy by the way, I wasn't making that up. I mean, just look at him! The only thing more generic than his design is his name. Nothing here is anything exceptional, which makes it a hard sell if you're not a Mega Man fan. Especially with that $10 price tag. Oof. Again, not a bad game or anything, but wait for this one to go on sale for about $4-inos, and only if you're a Mega Man fan. Quest for the Golden Duck. Okay, I can explain. So this is the perfect example of a game that was so heavily discounted. I took one look at it and it was like, eh, screw it, why not? Also by heavily discounted, I mean this was literally 20 cents or something. It was less than a quarter, description said it was 4 player co-op, thought it might be a decent distraction at the very least. Which isn't wrong, I guess? <laughs> but my god, just look at this. Somebody literally just bought a bunch of generic stock assets and made a Pac-Man clone of them. That's not me being an asshole either. Look at this, I legit found the sprite sheets for the animated characters, item pickups, and even the dungeon tile set used for this game. So yeah, as you can see, this is Pac-Man. There are a handful of levels, avoid the enemies and pick up all the coins, there are red gems that are the equivalent to Pac-Man's power pellets, you got clovers that turn you invisible, but the enemies can still kill you, so who cares? Then you have these bombs, which freeze enemies? That is the exact opposite thing I'd expect them to do. But there weren't any more sprites to use in the asset pack, I guess, so whatever. This game retails for $10, which is an absolutely horrendous deal and I'm convinced the only reason they price the game that high is so they could later mark the game down for under a buck and then that 99% off would seem like a better deal. This game isn't worth more than a quarter, but if it is discounted for that price, the co-op isn't terrible. You can kill 15 or so minutes with your buds playing this one. Sonic Mania. It's hard to know what to say about Sonic Mania that hasn't already been said before. 
That's a lie, of course. I practically thrive on unpopular opinions, so I got a whole senior thesis ready for this bad boy. Even so, I do plan to give this game its own standalone video in the future, so I'll keep it brief for now. My synopsis is that Sonic Mania is so faithful to classic 2D Sonic, it actually ends up inheriting many of the issues of the Genesis era Sonic. Stuff like blocks insta-killing you because they pinch your nose, and having the camera too zoomed in to see some oncoming hazards. In a weird way, I almost admire that though. The reason the game is designed this way is because the dev team really was just that passionate about classic Sonic that they likely didn't even see these things as problems. Passion really is the key word here. This game is oozing with charm. The fantastic vibrantly colored pixel art, the 2D hand-drawn animations, and even that music like Hot Damn. I would regard this as a reboot of sorts and as far as those are concerned, I don't think there's anything else I have more respect for than Sonic Mania. While I enjoy something like the Spyro remake, I don't respect it. It's a good game because the original was a good game, but a lot of the artistic choices made practically spit in the face of the PS1 predecessor. Simply put, changing a character design from this to that is not something that would have been done by a fan passionate for the original work. Sonic Mania is the absolute best example of what it looks like when a team of people passionate for the original work get together to tribute to something that defined their lives. Nothing feels shoehorned in. Every last damn pixel of this game feels so respectful to the source material, not to mention so incisively deliberate, I feel like I'm objectively obligated to respect it. A fantastic game, but hot damn is it short. If you are familiar with 2D Sonic, you'll likely blast through this game in two hours. That being said, if you do like what's here, there's enough replay value that I could safely say you'll put at least 10 hours into this. Mania is 20 bucks, and I would say it's worth that if you're already a Sonic fan. However, if you're already a Sonic fan, you likely already have three copies of this game. You don't have to be a fan of Sonic to enjoy this one, though. You just have to be a fan of 2D platformers. Pick it up if it goes on sale for about $10. Hollow Knight. I have always been really mixed on this game. It's not a bad game or anything. Far from it, in fact. I mean, there is so much to love about this game. It's a Metroidvania for one. Massive world, tons of collectibles, cool bosses, the whole nine yards. The theming? Absolutely fantastic. It's got a HR Geiger, Tim Burton-y thing about it. Medieval gothic, I'd call it. Whatever you want to call it, it looks great. The world building, heavily aided by the visuals, is arguably the game's biggest strength. There's a butt ton of lore in the world of Hollow Nest, at least from a narrative standpoint, is a fully realized one. My main qualm with the game is that I don't think the layout of the world is very interesting. You know, the level design. It seems that Team Cherry's aim was to prioritize a believable world, opposed to a mechanically interesting one. You play a game like Mega Man, and not only does each stage have drastically different theming and enemies, but they all have unique design quirks that define the level you're in. With the exception of a few areas, the majority of Hollow Knight doesn't really do that. I understand they wanted to make Hollow Nest feel like one cohesive world, but just about every area in a game like Cave Story feels pretty distinct, and that game has a cohesive world. Whereas here, in this game, if you remove the primary color of many of these areas, you know, make it completely grayscale. A lot of them would look nearly identical. Again, I really do believe the reason for this is because they prioritize believability, and more importantly, immersion. Credit where credit is due. They succeed in that facet of the game. I mean, you can see it for yourself, the game is downright stunning. If they cut the size of the world in half, but kept the same number of collectibles and bosses, I think the quality of the game would significantly increase. I'm sure there are many people who do not mind how spread out everything is because it gives you a prolonged break between bosses, and that's totally understandable. Nonetheless, a lot of the world just felt like filler opposed to something someone painstakingly designed every inch of. I know that is just something that will inherently happen when you make a world this big, I mean, this map is massive, but that's also why I'd prefer a trimmed down version. Quality over quantity. But hey, if you are someone who values quantity, then this is an easy recommendation because there is a lot here. Tons of content, secrets, and those bosses are just awesome. Best part of the game if you ask me. That being said, if you want to pick this one up, I would advise against getting it on Switch. This is a game you're going to want a good D-pad for, and none of the first party Switch controllers have that. I mean, the Joy-Cons don't even have a D-pad and spot one of the absolute worst modern analog sticks I've ever seen, especially given the drift. And then the Pro Controller, while a definite upgrade from the Joy-Cons, still has a really bad d-pad
keypad that is notorious for misreading inputs on top of it just being initially stiff. Not to mention, the Switch version of the game is capped at 720p. Given the atmosphere is what defines most of your playing experience of this one, you're likely going to want to play this in 1080. I don't know, maybe get it for your Switch if you just want that portability. Pricing wise, this is a tricky one. Hollow Knight fans are absolutely insane. I mean, there's no such thing as a casual Hollow Knight fan. This is an extremely brief overview, and I'm sure there are still fanboys already warming up their keyboards to let me know why all the critiques I just gave Hollow Knight are wrong and I'm not allowed to have those opinions. Those guys go all in. Makes me almost scared to say I personally would wait for this one to go on a sale. The game is $20 and there is undoubtedly $20 worth of content here. Whether or not you care about that content is going to come down to what you value in a Metroidvania. If you are a stickler for level design, then yeah, wait for a sale. Conversely, if level design doesn't really matter to you as long as you have strong lore and presentation, just go for it. Hollow Knights can be a very immersive experience, and it's immersed many gamers into its world for a reason. I do think it's a good game. Certainly a lot better than Exeo Drifter. This game is basically Hollow Knight if you took out everything that was good about that game, and didn't fix any of the weaker elements. Cause hot damn, if you thought some of the level design was bland in Hollow Knight, just wait until you get a hold of Exeo Drifter. This game has some of the most whatever level design I have ever seen in a Metroidvania. I was forgetting the layouts of this world while I was playing it. And then they make you fight this bug porcupine thing over and over a very few changes. Metroid 2 may have made you fight a bunch of Metroids, but aside from the fact that game was released on a console that was in black and white, you had a global counter of how many Metroids remained in the entire area. It made you feel like you were a predator hunting down a species, which was the point. Here in Exeo Drifter, you'll run into a boss room, get excited, then find out it's the same thing you fought three times already. The game feel is also pretty bad, but in ways that will astonish you what they overlooked. You know how in platformers, if you quickly tap the jump button, you will have a shorter hop than if you held down the button? You know, that thing that almost every platform game ever has? Well, Exeo Drifter does not have that. It was most noticeable for me when I was fighting the boss. When an enemy shoots tons of projectiles like this, all they want to do is some short hops to maneuver in between the bullets. But since you can't control your jump height, you can't do that. Am I being too harsh on this game? Eh, probably. I mean, you could do a lot worse for sure. The graphics, while simple, look nice. I particularly like the color palette of the game, plus the design of the main character, and especially the boss, are a lot of fun. It's priced at 10 on the Switch, and it's not worth that. You can 100% this game in under 2 hours, so yeah, definitely not worth the retail asking price. If you just got to have your hands on another Metroidvania, and you see it for a buck or so, I'd pick it up then. Kuso. The game might not look like much, and on the surface, I suppose it isn't. Just a basic platformer with the catch of being able to make your own checkpoints. However, there's one key element that defines this game. It's soundtrack. Every stage in the game has its own unique accompanying song. There's some hip-hop, house, some good variety, and it's all super chill. The game has got one hell of a mood. The psychedelic music contrasts well with the highly animated but extremely simplistic visuals. Every level is like a black void, and it can really suck you in. So I'm not the kind of guy that takes any sort of hallucinogens. I'm not even saying that to score good boy points. Like, I personally just don't do drugs. But if I did, I would imagine this would be the perfect game to play while stoned. Despite the tricky jump, the infinite and definable checkpoints make this a pretty casual playthrough. Pre-COVID, when my friends and I would be hanging out, kind of just blankly looking at the TV wondering what to do next, I would boot up Kuso just to hear some of the music. I know I'm not really being too descriptive with this one, but there really is something entrancing here that has caught the attention of every last person I have shown it to. Kuso is 5 bucks on the eShop, and I think that's an extremely reasonable price. Pick it up if you need a chill game to vibe to. Attack of the Toy Tanks. Hello, it is I, Wee Tanks guy coming back at ya for another video. Okay, so there's a lot of Wee Tanks clones made by indie devs. Ever since I became recognized as the Wee Tanks guy, I started getting sent some of these every now and then. I love checking these out, and in the case of Attack of the Toy Tanks, it would be exceptionally good was it not for one thing, the controls. In Wii Tanks, you just held the direction you wanted to go. Here though, up accelerates, down reverses, and left and right steer. 
<laughs> in other words, we have actual tank controls. I wouldn't be surprised if some people prefer this control method, although Attack of the Toy Tanks doesn't even have the option to change the control scheme to something more accessible. If you can get past the controls, and that's a pretty big if, Attack of the Toy Tanks is serviceable. The graphics are nice and clean, there is a co-op function, I think the bullet speed is way too fast, but it's not as much of a deal breaker as the controls are. This retails for $5, and if it wasn't for the controls, I would say that's a fair price. As it stands, the movement and aiming can be so clunky. You might want to wait for this one to be on sale for $2, unless you know for sure you can deal with the literal tank controls. Bouncy Bob. Oh no. Oh no! Hide the kids, okay? Just get the hell out of here, it's Bouncy Bob! This game is just... Just... Oh my god. I, ca I can't. In Bouncy Bob, you jump on enemies with some of the most intentionally bad controls you've ever seen. The A button does everything. Literally everything. You hold down the button, a cursor swings left to right, then you release it to go in that direction. Yeah, I know. Riveting. Is this just a mobile game that got ported? Oh, what do you know? It's the thing I just said. There is nothing else to this game. You're just hoping you land on enemies with the terrible controls. Jackbox 5 has a game called Zeepledome, which is one of the worst party pack games. And yeah, this is like that, except way worse. But hey, if you absolutely hate your friends, you can make them suffer through the game with you on the two player. Hey Kermit! What do you want, Gen Winner? Play this game with me. Fine, but I'm only doing it so I can embarrass you in front of all your viewers. <laughs> I'm sorry for anything I ever said about you! How much is this game? One buck? Even that is too much! Bad game! Get it when it's free! 100% off! Okay, we're done. No more games for today. Whew. Well guys, we played some good games, we played some bad games, but now, it's time to sing a song. Okay, not really, the video is over, bye. Hey, thanks for watching! This video is super late, so I will still be honoring last month's pledges. So special thanks to patrons such as David Pacheco, John Hancock, Amanda Guth, Raleigh Batter, Jan Kopp, Jeffrey P. Long, Oliver Larkosh, Cashinator, Victoria Mars, Abby Knudsen, Spoilers, and Metal Sonic 1789. Thank you so much for being patient. And until next time, have a good one.